quarters. Run out the guns. Stand by this tower battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Lynn stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. on the quarterdeck with my telescope trained towards Elgis theatres for more than an hour. It was a strange situation that major naval bases of Spain and England should be no more than six miles apart. And it was well to keep close watch on Elgis theatres for at any moment a, a squadron of Spaniards might push out suddenly and pounce on us. But we reached Gibraltar without incident and Captain Pellew left the ship to pay his respects to the port admiral. When he returned, he sent for me in his cabin. And as I went below, I wondered nervously what crimes I had committed. Come in. Acting Lieutenant Hornblower, sir? Ah, Mr. Hornblower. Acting Lieutenant, eh? You like that title? Sufficiently well, sir. Better than midshipman, eh? Oh, yes, sir. Still, not so good as Lieutenant, eh? Uh, no, sir. Well, Mr. Hornblower, then you ought to consider this good news. There will be an examination for Lieutenant tomorrow, Captain's board. What do you think of that, eh? Well, I'm uh, certainly interested, sir. Of course you are. The examination will be held aboard the old prison hulk over there, the Santa Barbara. You are ready to take it, I hope, Mr. Hornblower? Well, I, um... Are you? Uh, yes, sir. Let's see. You'll hold my order as acting Lieutenant for two months now. Is that right? Perfectly, sir. If you pass this examination, why then the day after tomorrow, you will be a full lieutenant with no nonsense about it. And you'll have two months seniority. Well, it sounds wonderful, sir, but, uh, but what? Well, nothing, sir, but... <laughs> uh, I was just thinking what would happen if I, if I, if I should fail. You would revert to midshipmen, naturally. And you'd lose about eight months of seniority. Because it'd be six months at least before you could try again. Yes, I know that, sir. Well, well. You say you do feel ready for this examination? Well, I, uh, uh... Oh, yes. Very well, then. A report to the Santa Barbara at 3 p.m. tomorrow with your certificates and journals. Aye, aye, sir. Tell Mr. Bolton you have my permission to go. You may use one of the ship's boats. Thank you, sir. That's all. Oh, and, uh, by the way... Yes, sir? Good luck, Hornblower. <laughs> I wished that I could be as confident of the examination as I pretended. The truth was, I, I hadn't expected it to come so soon. Well, there was nothing for it then but to get out Noddy's epitome of navigation and Clark's complete handbook of seamanship and try in the next 24 hours to be up on everything in those two thick volumes. And there were other things to be attended to besides. And my friend, midshipman Jack Brace, never let me forget them. Shoes. Hmm? Oh, what, what, what's that, Brace? I said shoes. Oh, look, 
trigonometry is difficult enough without your going cryptic on me, Brace, my boy. What do you mean? You'll have to wear your buckle shoes, remember? Oh, good heavens, that's true. Well, chuck them to me, laddie buck. I'll go to the gun room and get them polished. So he took my shoes and I went back to my navigation. It was a long time before Brace came back. Here, take this. Hmm? What? Oh, what's that? My clean shirt. You don't own a clean one. Oh, you know, oh thanks very much. Uh, not at all. What about my shoes? Oh, um, oh, well, don't worry. Oh, great, Neptune. Haven't you got them polished yet? The gun room supply of shoe blacking is dry to a chip. Oh, no. Well, that's all right. I had two of the men work it soft with lard. Oh, well. Uh, Unfortunately, the resultant compound stubbornly refuses to take a polish. Well, then he got what am I to do, man? I have two men now at work with the gun room's melting shoe brush. When oh. they're through with that, they'll use a soft cloth. Now, don't worry. We'll bring your shoes up to a condition of brightness worthy of an examination for Lieutenant. Oh. I was by no means satisfied with what I knew of navigation, but I did have to close that book and start on the handbook of seamanship. And, oh, I felt so abysmally ignorant. Jack Brace's interruptions at least served the purpose of taking my mind off my desperate lack of knowledge. Bridget. Uh, what are you talking about this time, Brace? Breeches? Hey, give me the breeches to your number one uniform. Oh? I'll have them pressed for you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jack. Now, don't mention it, Larry Buck. The words in the complete handbook of seamanship began after a while to dance before my eyes. It seemed completely meaningless to my befuddled brain. It was as if from a great distance that sometime later I again heard the voice of Midshipman Brace. Liquor. Hmm. What's that? What's that? What do you say? I said liquor. Your spirit ration from the British Navy. Give it to me quickly. You, you haven't drunk it, have you? No. Oh, well, then trot it out. Look sharp. But why? So that the gun room attendant will be able to press your breeches. Well, is he going to press them with a tin cup half full of rum? Oh, of course not. The liquor's for the warrant cook. Oh, why should he have my rum ration? Because if the gun room attendant is to press your breeches, he has to heat a flat iron in the galley. Oh. Well, the cook went to line to do that without some payment. And, and oh, all right, it's all right. There's today's spirit ration over there. I was keeping it till later. If you want to be a lieutenant, you have to make sacrifices, Wondler. It went on like that through the afternoon, and most of the night, and all of the next morning. And by the end of that time, I was turning rather frantically from Norrie's text to Clark's and back again to Norrie's navigation. The only question in my mind was which one baffled me more. Finally, the boat was ready to carry me to the Santa Barbara. I'd made myself resplendent with my sword and white breeches and buckled shoes, and my bundle of journals under my arm, my certificates of sobriety and good conduct in my pocket. Brace had only one last word of advice. Your hat. I couldn't get the dents out of it. What? Oh, take it off as soon as you can and keep it under your arm. Maybe they won't see you come up the ship's side. When I got aboard the Santa Barbara, I was directed aft to a portside cabin. And when I entered that cabin, my heart sank down to those buckled shoes. For there was a whole cabin full of other midshipmen, all of them dressed like myself, all of them ready to take that examination. One of them spoke to me. Welcome to the black hole of Calcutta. Oh, for the love of... How many are there here, anyhow? You're the 40th. 40? How many... How many will they pass, do you think? Five? <laughs> I doubt it. Do you know who's examining us? No. Dreadnought Foster, for one. Oh, no. He's a tail twister as ever there was one. And Captain Harvey of the dockyard. I don't know him. Well, you wouldn't want to. Well, who's the third? I don't like to tell you. Well, I don't like to have you tell me, then. But you might as well. Come on. Black Charlie Hammond. Oh, Lord. Oh, he's almost as bad as Dreadnought Foster, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> he passed through here looking as if he'd lost a guinea and found sixpence. Huh? Well, we may as well sit here and wait our turn. But much good it'll do us. We waited. The first man came back from his examination. But she had failed and informed us that they began by asking him to define a, a rum line. Thirty-nine midshipmen had their textbooks open on the instant and re-read about rum lines. Candidates departed and candidates returned, most gloomy, some smiling. The afternoon wore on. Twilight came, 
Night came. And finally, my new friend left. And ten minutes later, he was back. He had failed. It was my turn now. I straightened my neckcloth and saw to it that my sword hung correctly at my side. In an agony of nervousness, I, I went into the examining room to stand before the three grim faces across the table. Well, sir, report yourself. We have no time to waste. Huh. Hornblower, sir. Horatio Hornblower, midshipman. Uh, I mean, acting lieutenant, HMS Indefatigable, sir. Your certificates, please. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, they're in order. You're a close hold on the port tack, Mr. Hornblower. Beating up channel with a northeasterly wind blowing hard with Dover bearing north two miles. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Now the wind veers four points and takes you flat aback. What do you do, sir? What do you do? Oh, no, no rum lines. Yeah, uh, what's that? Uh, nothing. What do you do? Quickly. Well, um, I'm... I, by now you're dismasted. Dismasted with the Dover cliffs under your lead. Sir, you're in serious trouble, Mr. Um, Hornblown. Well, sir, I think that, um... Oh, did you say four points, sir? Because if it were... That's gunfire out there. Cannon! Come on, let's get back to our ships. Unceremoniously, they rushed out of the cabin, sweeping aside the sentry at the door. I followed them. And with the three captains, I arrived in the waist, just in time to see a rocket soar up into the night sky, bathed in a shower of red stars. Points! It's the general alarm! Fire ships! Fire ships! Observe the watch! Call my gig! Huh? You don't expect to find the gig now, do you, Hammond? All our ships in the harbor beat to quarters. Across half a mile of dark water, a yellow light flew. Ships wrapped in flame. A line of fire ships was running before the wind, straight into our crowded anchorage. Let one of those blazing hulls make contact with one of our vessels, and instantly the fire will be transmitted to the dry painted timber, to the tarred cordage, to the inflammable sails. To men in highly combustible ships filled with explosives, fire is the deadliest and most dreaded peril of the sea. And this was the peril we all faced now. You saw those, sir! You saw those! Come alongside! Come alongside, confound you! Come alongside or I'll fire at you! Simply there, make ready to get over the top. There's a way to bring him, Captain Foster. He's coming. Here, yeah, gentlemen, we'll tell this slugger man where to take us. Take to our own ship. Instantly. Come on, gentlemen. ran to the mizzen chains and flung themselves down into the boat. I was right at their heels. It was my bounden duty to get back to my ship as soon as possible. But then I knew there was no chance of a junior officer's finding a boat to take him back. Perhaps after the captains reached their ships, if they reached them, well, I could do the same, perhaps. I threw myself in as they pushed off, nearly knocking the breath out of Captain Harvey. Oh, oh. Answer this, answer this. I didn't mean to, 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 to knock into you, sir. Well, young man, where are you going? Well, I I should go to the indefatigable, sir. After you're all conveyed to your ships, of course. Mm. Well, Osborne, go, can't you? This is no time to sit there keeping. Pull away. Where to? I'm not in the Navy. I'm a British civilian. Pull for my ship, the Dreadnought. No, no. Look here, Captain Foster. I'm the senior. Pull for the Calypso. And at once, that's the Dreadnought's mirror. I'm the yes, woman. Please, please, we must get started. Calypso it is. But pull, Osmond, pull. I have the tiller. in Gibraltar Harbor in the middle of a dangerous action. And my companions were a reluctant oarsman and the three captains of the captain's board. Their tempers had not markedly improved. Pull! Oh, pull! My ship's in danger. I suppose you don't think that mine is too, Foster. Look, sirs. 
Look, there's one of the fire ships now, sir. Where? Well, just out of us, sir, over there. She's swinging round. She's across Santa Barbara's cable. She's going to ram the Santa Barbara. Heaven help her on board there. Ah, sir, the old Santa Barbara has 2,000 prisoners battened down below decks, hasn't she? That fire ship will be alongside her any minute. Sir, with a man at the wheel of a fire ship, she, she could be steered clear, then. Well, don't you think so? We ought to do it. Put the tiller over, Captain Harvey. Over it is. Now pull. You all but He said pull. I, uh, I don't want to. What's that you say? If I pull alongside that fire ship, We'll all go up in smoke. Your sword, Hammond? Yeah. Now, you oarsmen, you see this sword? Now pull, pull, pull! Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Lay us under her counter. I'll jump for it. Let me go, Captain Foster, sir. I'll handle her. Come with me if you like, Hornblow. Thank you, sir. May need two of us. Our boat swung under the stern of the fire ship. She was before the wind again now, and just gathering way just heading down upon the Santa Barbara. I stood up on the fort and jumped. My hands gripped something, and with a kick and a struggle, I dragged myself up onto the empty deck. Captain Foster followed. With a brig before the wind, the flames were blown forward. Right aft where we were, the heat was terrifying. I ran forward to the wheel. It was lashed with a loop of line, and as I cast this off and seized the spokes, I... I could feel the rudder below me bite into the water. We're going to collide with the Santa Barbara. Hard over. <sighs> Hard over, it is her. Lee over, flames coming this way. But hold on to that wheel. <clears throat> I've, I've, I've got her, sir. Hard on Lee. She's turning, sir. Keep her over. We might kill them. We're going to... Gonna... Pass the Santa Barbara, so we're going to pass her. We did it, sir. We did it. Down on your knees. But hold that course. Uh, hold starboard a point. Starboard a point, sir. Uh, we'll lay her ground on the shoulder of the neutral zone. All right. Look, there's the dauntless on the fort now. Keep her clear. But, Breathe, sir. Hurry, sir. Hold, sir. Sir, for example, what did it find? What did it? The tiller ropes must have burned away. The wheels spinning. I, I can't steal her, sir. All right, for the tap wheel. Come on, sir. <laughs> the water closed over me, and I felt panic as I struggled back to the surface. It was cold. I could see nothing in the darkness with my eyes still dazzled by the roaring flames. Somebody splashed beside me. Oh, oh no. I say, I, I, they were... They were following us in the boat. Yes. To take us off. I hope they... hope they get to us. Can, can you swim? No, 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 not, not very well, sir. I can't, either. Ahoy! Ahoy! No. Helen! Harvey! Ahoy! Ahoy! Can I see him, sir? Oh, oh. where are they? No. Where are they? Fell back with a splutter, almost choking with water. They were both growing weaker. I wondered if he felt the same despair that I felt. And I, I suppose he did. For even captains of much seniority are only mortal men after all. How long we struggled side by side in the water until he spoke to me again, I, I don't know. Oh, oh, horn blower. What's that? The boat. Where's the boat? Huh? Oh, call them. Oh. I can't. Hi! Boys! Hi! Oh, they're, they're headed towards us. Yes, sir. Oh, here they come. Here they come. Oh. Oh. Here, here it is. Hang it on onto the sides. Uh, go ahead, sir. Got it. Come on, you men up there. 
was only of Captain Foster beside me. Then presently, for the first time, somebody in this boat spoke. I felt a cold shiver pass over my skin. The man was speaking in Spanish. Adelante, todos vamos. ground to make for the Spanish borders. Hmm. That's their best chance. It's a dark night. There are two other ships burning themselves out there, over there, sir. There were three fire ships came in in all, I think. Well, that was my count, sir. Three. Well, that means that none of them did any damage. Good. Huh. But a bold endeavor. Yeah. Who ever well would have credited the Dons with making such an attempt? Well, they've learned about fire ships from us, perhaps. Huh. We may have Nursed the pinion that impelled the steel, eh? Well, it is possible, sir. Well, I suppose it is. <laughs> so, let's lean back, Hornblower. If we're to be prisoners, let's at least try to make ourselves comfortable. Captain Foster was a cool enough customer, quoting poetry and discussing the naval situation while being carried off into captivity. I tried to emulate him leaning back unconcernedly against the side of the boat. I would not have wanted Dreadnought Foster to realize that I was shivering from something other than the chilly wind. I wondered what hardships a prisoner of the Spaniards might have to undergo. Then suddenly, there was a voice, an English voice from across the water. Oh, There's an armed boat, sir. Or, or a British guard boat. About time. Continue on our Ahoy! 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 Captain Hammond? 
After your fire ship cleared the Santa Barbara, a puff of wind took you on so fast, we, we couldn't keep up with you. Most interesting, Captain Hammond. It called for Spaniards to save us from drowning. I thought I could rely on two brother captains. May I ask what you're implying, sir? I make no implications, but others may read implications into a simple statement of fact. I consider that an offensive remark, sir. I congratulate you on your perspicacity, sir. Apparently, I shall have to send a friend to wait on you, sir. He will be welcome. I sat amazed, listening to the two British captains planning to duel with each other and on top of everything that had happened. They didn't speak to each other again. And Foster came aft and sat beside me. For some time, we drifted along in silence. And my thoughts went to my interrupted examination for Lieutenant. I had a wild hope. I had, after all, it seemed to me, behaved rather well that night. And Captain Foster was certainly in a position to know it. I had, as I say, a, a wild hope. And finally, Foster spoke to me. Andre. Hi, sir. I shall have much to do before morning. Uh, you, sir, Mr. Hornblower, will carry out my orders. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, these prisoners. I want you to find someone who can speak their lingo and have it explained to them that I shall send them back to Cartagena under cartel, free, without exchange. They saved our lives, and that's the least we can do in return. I think that's, I, I think that's very just, sir. Mm. <laughs> and you, my fire-breathing friend. <laughs> May I offer you my thanks? Mm. Thank you, sir. You did well. Should I live beyond tomorrow, I shall see that the proper authorities are informed of your worthy action. Well, thank you, sir. And, uh, uh, sir. Well? Um, my examination for lieutenant, sir, my certificate, um... That particular examining board will never reassemble, of course. You must wait your opportunity to go before another one. But, sir, I, I, well, I thought possibly... Well? Well, I thought, sir, that in view of all that's happened, it, you, well... You yourself, sir, said that I did all right tonight, sir, and I mean... Now, look ye here, Mr. Hornblower. The examination is a thing entirely separate from the events of this evening. Yes, sir. In the examination, to the best of my recollection, you were flat aback, about to lose your spars and with Dover Cliffs under your lee. In one more minute, you would have failed. It was the Spanish attack that saved you, isn't that so? I... I suppose it is, quite, quite so, sir. Ah. Then be thankful for small mercies. And even more thankful for big ones, Mr. Hornblow. I, I, sir. I, well, I suppose you're right, sir, of course, sir. Oh, well, I suppose that when I've acquired the viewpoint of a, well, a, a, a true Navy man more completely, but, well, then, sir, I, I suppose I can fully realize when I, when I look back that, well, <laughs> on the whole, I was, well, a very fortunate midshipman tonight, sir. Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Thank you.